Hi, Cheryl. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, Tasha. Good to be with you. Mm. So I was sharing with you just now that for me, these conversations are um, sort of like a portrait of someone and showing me and the world who they are, not through a painting, but through conversation. And I am very curious about you and you have qualities that I would love to understand more deeply and see more clearly and also share and portray through this conversation. And so it feels like a real privilege to speak with you and uh, to get to know you better. And um, that metaphor of a portrait actually feels somewhat potent right now insofar as uh, if there was a visual painting, there'd be like a frame around it and then there'd be the, the actual painting in the frame. And so I think for me, this question that I ask everyone about a life story is kind of a frame that contains uh, yeah. the portrait that I'm trying to share. And we always start there and it's like, yeah, what what's happened to you in your life? And how do you make sense of what's happened? And um, you kind of get to choose which frame you want to put on it. But I love to hear that question. And it really contains for me, um, it, it makes a space for the depths of someone to emerge and for that portrait to come through. And then in the center, I really want to know um, yeah, about the specifics of specific things that someone's interested, in, but ultimately I'm interested in the qualities of their soul and their character and who they are and want to portray those through the conversation. And so, um, you know, like I'm listening to someone and, and watching them and seeing them. And of course, there's sort of surface level, conceptual, factual things that I'm often interested in. But the thing I'm most interested in ultimately is like, who is this person? And what are they on about? So um, mm. feels like a privilege to get to spend this time with you and see you better. And uh, yeah, I'd love to start by asking you this question that I ask everyone about your life story. And that will sort of frame our conversation and do feel free to answer this in whatever way you like. Uh, short, long, metaphorical, factual, uh, tell a long story that is weaving many threads together or just very brief, whatever's good. Love to hear whatever you'd like to share. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tashin. And maybe before I begin, I just wanted to yeah, share some of what's somatically present for me as well. I was noticing that as you were describing the frame around the portrait, that there was actually um, like an immediate felt memory of being like th three or four and or probably a little bit older because I'm sitting at a desk next to the window in the classroom. And I was just staring out into the blue sky and I was watching the clouds. And that's, that's almost like all I would do. I would just sit at my desk and look out at the clouds. And my teacher, because I was in Hong Kong then, um, and I was in this kind of like pretty rigid culture, even for little children, it's like, you sit in lines, like being a good child is to sit very still and to be very obedient and to like ask for permission before doing anything. And yeah, there was this way in which um, I think something in my being always felt some kind of like, I was always leaking out of frames I'm always leaking out of frames. And I remember actually just wanting to disappear into the clouds a lot of the time. And my teacher would actually call in my parents and tell them that I wasn't paying attention enough or I would get up um, without asking for permission and just walk around or go to the washroom. So I was actually seen very much like as... Um, 
like an aberrant child in some way, especially in Hong Kong culture. But I don't know, when you were describing the frame, like I was actually feeling the frame of the window, like feeling the frame of a window that can contain like the expanse of the sky and the clouds that float through it. And it was actually creating like a quality much more less of like trapping or like a form of enclosure that's about constraint, but actually a form of like enclosure that's more like sanctuary. Like here's a frame to be able to enter and feel held. Um, even if you're a weird fluid cloud being most of the time. <laughs> so I was just noticing that and it was, it was like creating a real sense of safety actually and trust in relating with you. And I felt like kind of, oh, I'm held in this frame that you've created. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So life story, I guess I, I started a little bit. Um, I was born in Hong Kong in 1988. My mom and dad really wanted to have children in 1988 because it's the year of the gold dragon. And apparently the percentage of children um, that were born in that particular year, just like there was like a significant, um, yeah, a significant um, difference because it's a, yeah, dragons are considered very lucky in Chinese culture. And yeah, it, it's, I don't remember too much from my childhood in terms of direct memory. I do, I, for some reason, I do want to share probably my first direct memory that I have from my childhood because it had, it's, weaved into it feels it feels like salient and meaningful in attempting to make sense of why I am like why I am where I am now but otherwise like I think I just had a really loving childhood um I have a younger brother Mark who is a year and a half younger than me and I was yeah, I grew up with a lot of family around. We would go to my grandma and grandpa's house every single Sunday, the whole family, because my mom has a lot of siblings. And then we would all just meet and sit around this big round table, like usually up to 15, 20 of us. And we would always have family dinner on Sundays at my grandma and grandpa's. And I think I was like a very, my reputation as a child was, I was referring to earlier, like teachers thought I was a bit of a problem because I was spacey. Um, but in my home life and among my family, I was considered like really, really bratty. Like they just, <laughs> they thought I had way too much energy and it was like very uncontained. And I was very difficult to, manage and control like um yeah there's myriad stories whenever my family comes back together about how um yeah I was a very very uncontrollable child <laughs> but I but I think it was also out of um it was hard for me to follow rules like I didn't really understand it wasn't that I was resisting them or defiant it was more so that they didn't really make sense to me and I think there was like a transparency to them like if someone told me you have to sit here because that's what you're supposed to do and you should just be quiet like I just wouldn't get it um so because of that I just yeah I guess was labeled as a bit of a problem child um and then Yeah, another, another story, and I was talking about it with my mom, actually, just two weeks ago, I was remembering it. And it's a story that she doesn't like very much, like whenever we bring it up, she she's like very viscerally uncomfortable about it. And 
it was, it was because like, it's kind of like a motherly instinct around when I was three. Um, we were in a pool and I was running around kind of like, um, doing my own thing. And I guess at some point my mom kind of lost track of me and I, and when she turned around and tried to look for me, I was at the bottom of the pool and I was drowning and she didn't know how long I'd been there for. She was kind of seeing me float up, but, um, mostly I just kept dropping back to the bottom of the pool. And it's interesting because I hear her side of like her side of the story and so much of memory is, yeah, it feels like the contours of memory are often, especially from early childhood are more um, sketched or drawn by like the memories of adults. But this is actually a memory that I have. Um, and I remember it's like the first image that feels truly mine is like feeling feeling a kind of burning sensation in my chest from presumably lack of oxygen but actually like just looking up at the water like where the surface of the water um from below creating these ripples like and having sun just like seeing light shine through it and feeling just completely mesmerized by the way that light was folding in the water and like feel and just like having this utter sense of serenity actually kind of like I could, yeah, even though I could feel like fear in my body, it also felt completely calm, like serene. Um, yeah, and and then the story goes that um, I was picked up out of the water and they weren't sure, like they, they didn't know how I was doing. I was kind of out and then they pressed a hand on my belly and then like all this water just basically spilled out like waterfalled out of my mouth so they just kept pressing water out of my body um but yeah because of that it's like I've always been kind of like a watery being um maybe it's because at some point the water just took me um and I took in the water but yeah, I've always been since, like, it's like for as long as I've remembered, like, just, I would always want to walk to ponds, rivers, oceans, just to be around larger bodies of water that kind of like hold everything. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like, that's where I want to begin, just like early childhood, like, held in family, held in water, and held in like a quality of serenity. And actually, like, I think now as an adult, I would call it grace. Like, oh, I felt held by grace for some reason, even if I didn't understand it as a child. Yeah, and then and then I moved to Canada and Toronto and I immigrated. Um, And that was a major shift, actually. I think a kind of a way of being that was very intuitive and like kind of not, I don't know, it, like in a, just like a kind of utter trust in wandering the world and playing my own games and responding to like birds and imaginary figures like I think when I moved to Canada like when I immigrated when I was six it was just it was almost like I suddenly felt myself like othered like I, I felt alienated from my own body because I was just aware of being kind of like this Chinese immigrant kid and I was going to school and I didn't know English very well um and yeah there was this kind of quality of oh I want to I want to fit in I want to belong I want to be like the reg, like, you know, like the, 
regular kids who seem like they've like grown up and are often yeah have this yeah have this way of being that I I I was suddenly alienated from just yeah so I think there was something about that time like and it's such an it's such a classic immigrant story it's like any I think any kid any young person who has experienced like being taken out of like a familiar space. Um, and it's a very common story. It's like, you just experience life much more as this liminal um, domain. Like you end up being like halfway between what is familiar and what is not a lot of the time. And you see yourself a lot from outside suddenly. Um, so, yeah, in some ways, like, I feel like since that point, um, since that kind of like rupture in my, in the innocence of my consciousness, I've been like recovering that as an adult. Like, how do I come back to this, like completely embodied, like full confidence um, and like kind of settling in, in of my awareness into the grace of the world? Um, but yeah, it's been a journey. So I think I'm going to pause here because I'm also curious what's here for you. And I, I, I think I'm like seeking your steering a little bit too. <laughs> oh, that's great so far. Uh, I'm, I'm wrapped with attention about it. Uh, I love the story about you sort of not quite fitting the controlling rules in Hong Kong and uh, almost wish I had more of that in my own childhood. And uh, I feel really touched by this story about you in the pool and the grace that you experienced and um, almost a sense of, um, I mean, I imagine that being a really precious experience for you that would be hard for, you know, your mother or others to relate to. They're like, that, that what happened to you? <laughs> you know, like they were concerned for your safety and you were going to die and you're like yeah there's some burning in my chest but I also felt held by grace and uh it was a really beautiful experience and uh very significant for me and um, mm. um I'm also thinking about uh how it seems like a number of my friends that I really love and trust are sort of um, maybe like bicultural or have multiple experiences in their childhood or languages or, um, you know, like a really interesting mix of influences that they're synthesizing, that there's not really a clear, um, you kind of have to find your own context or sense-making around how different things relate and I feel like I'm reflecting on the people in my life who are like that and um, I see a capacity in those kinds of people to meet the complexities of our world and also uh, an intelligence and a wisdom that comes from that kind of a situation that's like sort of painfully earned often but uh, mm -hmm. as adults they they make incredible friends generally uh, is my experience. And so that's present for me as I hear about you immigrating. And um, yeah, I'm curious what happened after you were six and uh, how you got here and what happened in between. And um, mm. I would be curious to hear more of what happened to you. And um, how you started to develop different interests and respond to the world and show up you know in your education or work or anything like that be very curious to hear more of the story mm, thank you mm -hmm. i just i want to share that for some reason when i talk to you tashin i always feel like i'm on the brink of tears mm. <laughs> or like when i hear you speak like it's like it's just an interesting um maybe it's not always but 
it feels like it happens with you more often than mm -hmm. with others um, in the encounters that we've had. Yeah. Um, I think there's also a memory of, yeah, there's something kind of orthogonal about this memory inserting in and it's actually through I want to share it through something oh wow I'm surprised I want to share this <laughs> uh you'll understand like it's gonna feel like it's a divergence but I was I was at um Willow the Canadian branch of the monastic academy for this three-month monastic residency and it was co-held by like our mutual friends Daniel, Ryu, um, and Seishin and it was really yeah that that happened about I think like three years ago three the summer of 2021 and specifically what I'm pointing to is a way to gesture to kind of like post like it's like when I immigrated from six or seven to you could say like my university years I I I think that was it was while I was um at one point Seishin looked at me um after after a kind of like really raw expression of something that was deeply true in my being and it's like that kind of like when you just when the energy moves through you there's there's no like there's no like oh what what is this going to look like how do I refine it in a way that makes sense to others it's just like ah like I was just um really really experiencing like a raw expression of truth and she told me afterwards um she told me that at times she sees me as this being with like angel wings, but sometimes the angel wings are like too perfect and they almost feel like they could be made out of plastic. And what she was describing was when I experienced this like raw expression of truth from you, it was like one of the plastic feathers fell out and like a real feather grew in. Mm. And it was, it was one of those like um, moments where I was both encountering like the harshness actually of the feedback of being seen as someone with plastic wings, you could say. And then also like the kind of hard truth of the feedback and then the, the be like the benevolence of um, the potential of being able to like, um, grow through any plastic any plastic yeah like feathers that I had painstakingly glued on for myself in order to fit in so I stayed with her feedback and I was meditating with it and I remember at one point I was just sitting and I felt myself just like go right back to me when I was 13 years old and at that point I was just like in art school, I went to, I went to an arts high school and I was like, yeah, like I think all the ways in which I felt like I wasn't fitting in and I felt really awkward and like, I felt this kind of distance in being able to connect with anyone. Like I just, I just felt this kind of extreme like awkwardness, just like, I don't fit in the world. I don't fit in school. I don't like something about me just doesn't fit and it was really, really painful. And I, I like hid myself in art. So I just wrote a lot of stories. I painted a lot. I, yeah. And I, I read a lot of books. Like I just disappeared into the imaginal, you could say. But I remember actually, there was this image of me in my meditation that came through where I was in the art studio as like a 13 year old. And I remember, um, it's like on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you can stay really late at school and just keep working on your artwork. And I was like seeing myself sitting at this large wooden table 
and I was working so hard. I was so diligent. I, it looked like I was there at like midnight or 1am or something. And we did work really hard on our art projects, but I was building a set of wings. I was just like fabricating this beautiful set of wings. And I had kind of like scavenged all of these yeah, like plastic bags, like garbage, detritus, essentially. I'd scavenged all this detritus and I was trying so hard. I was working so hard and like turning this garbage into something beautiful that I could adorn myself with and wear. And I just like saw myself as this, yeah, like awkward um, 13 year old self that like, honestly is quite cringeworthy. It's like, when you look at your live journals from that age, but I saw how hard she worked. Like I saw the sincerity with which she was fashioning beauty out of ugliness. And then suddenly it was like all the shame that I was feeling around. Um, yeah. Ways in which when I was, especially in those teen years, like fashioning, like ways of blending in, like ways of, being normal ways of yeah like it's almost like costumes that I could wear in order to be able to fit in more and have people like me like I think I just like really admired the savviness and the yeah like the gumption of like a young girl painfully not fitting in just like rolling up her sleeves and being like well like I need to survive. I want to, I'm going to make this happen. So I think that was a lot of me like in high school and especially going into college. Like I studied philosophy and English, but I just like went through this. It was interesting. I was super, I had amazing friends, um, but we were all weird art school kids and we would just make weird films and like hide and like, yeah, hide under stairs often. And um make yeah we would make movies together um it was very art school confidential just like yeah I feel like a kind of I was really into graphic novels then too but there's like this kind of like gritty grimy like um yeah we just we kind of I really enjoyed feeling also like I did my own thing but I also like also wanted to fit in and then when I went, when I got to college, that was when I felt like, I think I blossomed a lot more. Like it was almost like, then I, this, these wings that I had created for myself in the workshop, like I could wear them. And it was like, I suddenly blossomed. Um, and I think I felt more, I felt more beautiful. I felt more likable. I felt more. I felt like I knew how to, I learned how to talk to people in a way that um, would feel kind of like harmonious and yeah, but I also, I just, I just like, didn't really feel like me, um, like not fully. Um, it was almost like, Yeah, it was almost like I I achieved something that I thought was like the right way to fit in when I was younger. And then when I got there, I just felt kind of like an imposter. Like I, I was wearing plastic wings and some people thought they were real um, and were dazzled by it, but it wasn't like it wasn't really. Yeah, it wasn't like the art that actually wasn't the art that felt like I wanted to live for. So yeah, you could say that since like, it's like, since I, since I felt also then like this pain of inauthenticity to some extent, it's like not being fully myself, like, yeah, not really like, yeah, just not feeling true just not feeling true
Yeah, that's when I started making art again. I think I, I started making art again because I was, I wanted to feel it was true. When you were in art school as a teenager, what were your, almost like aesthetics, like what did you care about at that time? What did you think was cool? What was beautiful to you at that time? Ooh, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, I really... Yeah, I want to take a moment. Such a special question. This is such an interesting, like I, I, I had such a diverse range of different art and stories that I was consuming. But for some reason, this artist, um, there's this Japanese horror artist called Jinji Ito. And he kind of has this, um, he's almost like the HP Lovecraft of the East. Um, and he makes, yeah, just like these like, He's still, he's still around, he's contemporary, but he makes these like really, really um, like uncanny, dark comics that like bring you to the edge of like the horror in the mundane and also in the, in the kind of like spaces in between. So I, there was like a kind of strange fascination, I would say with, um, yeah, like a like a kind of Lovecraftian kind of horror, like a cosmic horror. But I was also really into, yeah, like I loved Daniel Close as well, who was this. I really wanted to be, I really wanted to be like a comic artist. I think I really enjoyed and like found the ability to like work with the form of, yeah, like frames, frames in pages to depict like the movement of time and relationality between characters. And I think I just found like the form of it remarkably innovative. And there are so many artists, like there's, um, yeah, what's his name? forgot his name I haven't I haven't I haven't actually thought about my my like teen love of comics for a very long time um but yeah there was like a kind of fa fascination I think with what is unspoken or unseen or kind of like hidden away into like hidden under the rug hidden behind the bed hidden like um behind closet doors so there was definitely a kind of, yeah, fascination with that. I was also, this is later on, but I, like sim in the similar vein, I was also really into the work of like David Lynch. Um, and I really, yeah, it was similar. Like I remember when I watched Mulholland Drive, like it was, it like blew me away. Just the way in which it, I think it felt closer, especially at that time as a teenager, like it felt so close to my experience of reality, like everything not quite like kind of like swirling between like what is real and what is dream. Like, again, sometimes like there is like a sinister quality to not quite knowing what is concrete. Um, and for some reason being almost like compelled to go into that dark corridor even if your whole body is like filled with a kind of 
like trembling dread. Like there was something about that where uh, I just, I was very drawn to, um, yeah, I think art that evoked the felt experience of liminality and didn't try to sugarcoat it or make it, yeah, like make it something that's really clean and light and bright. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that was definitely something I enjoyed. And a lot of my art was, the art that I made was so, like so, so ambitious. Like I would, I remember my high school, like, you know, final project. I just, I, I decided to create like a fresco because I wanted to know how, I wanted to understand and like embody what it was like to paint on wet clay, like the way that the ancients would. Um, and then I painted like a Renaissance painting. I was like, then I want to paint an oil painting like the, <laughs> like the Renaissance uh, painters would. And I, I just like created this really, it's kind of cringy to remember, but like this like massive uh, kind of like Renaissance style painting of like a king with like one side is, um, like his kingdom like falling into decay and um yeah there was definitely a moral uh there was definitely like yeah morals embedded into my work as well or like an or an exploration of what um what morality was like in these times so anyway there was like a renaissance painting that I created that I spent like so much time on just like needing to have like the perfect image of like the bag of gold that he's holding and the image of this kind of angelic being um and then I created a digital piece and then I was like and then now like the contemporary time and we digitize like reality and I just like I just photoshopped a self-portrait but I like turned myself into like zeros and ones like it was like mm. half binary code and half like perfectly paint like yeah photoshopped like a uh, likeness and I so I think there was this ambition to almost like work with art as a way to gesture towards like these meta narratives of how yeah how we try how do we how we make sense of self other and world given these different times um yeah so i just i was making i was making weird work weirdly ambitious work <laughs> well it seems like you were describing it as cringe earlier and I'm like well that sounds really cool actually to me I'm like that's cool I <laughs> I admire that uh I like and I appreciate hearing about it uh, it makes me curious about now and when you either see art now or make art now like what you sort of the same question of what you find beautiful or what's compelling to you but at this time mm. Yeah, I've always um I've always had a very wrought relationship with being an artist. Um I think because it is it's actually in like my deepest soul aspiration to be the kind of artist that Yeah. I don't know. This is, this is, yeah, how I remember hearing, I can't remember the exact source, but there was a story about a woman who I think was in the Amazon or something and she sees this beautiful snake just like this like beautiful almost like luminous snake that just shimmered in different colors as it was moving 
And she was just watching it like undulate, just like with the liveness in, yeah, like in the wild. And she, she tells the person that she's with, like, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Like, this is so beautiful. And then I think it's like later that day, she finds the snake skinned and gifted to her by this person. And he says like, oh, it's be like, I wanted to, I wanted you to be able to take this snake, beautiful snake skin home with you. And she describes just like crying. Like she, she like kind of looks at this, yeah, dead snake skin. And she just starts crying. And she's so heartbroken because like what she had fallen in love with was just like the aliveness. Like she was just like in love with the aliveness of this being and it was just gone. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, and I, that's like, there's something in that. That's what I seek in art. It's like a, that kind of aliveness, the, yeah, it's like the, the glimmer or like something, yeah, just like even when you look at skin, like you can kind of see all this movement beneath it. There's so many layers of aliveness that's just like shimmering and yeah, there's, there's, there's this, um, shimmer to everything <laughs> when you when you look at it in with the kind of when you really allow it to make contact with you there's just this like shimmering aliveness like I, I I understand why so many indigenous cultures are animist it's just like everything is so alive everything is like constantly breathing um and it's not even just like I think it's easier to see like I'm I'm touching this plant in front of me right now and I can just like feel it humming um but it's also like I I can feel it really in in technology like I'm, now I'm touching my like laptop and it's just like I can feel that humming with a kind of aliveness and I feel it in fields like I feel it in relationship like there's this there's like me and you Tashin and there's like this quality of connection that is in itself like an artwork like just like this kind of field um and sometimes I sense it as like say me and you here there's like a quality of for some reason we're drawn together in this moment we're gathered together in this framed portrait moment but there's also something there's like a latent potential that has its own like density that's unfolded like I can just it's almost like I can feel something like glowing in it and often it kind of looks like cosmos to me like the beginning of like a galaxy being born or like a star being born but I can just like feel something swirling and there's all this latent aliveness um it's like potential potential beings that are just asking for for like asking for our attention like asking for yeah, like asking for a way of looking and a, a way of seeing that just like births them like into being. And yeah, I, I don't, that's the kind, <laughs> that's what comes up when I think about the art that I want to create. It's not, it's not that I'm 
creating it. Like I'm not making it. It's more like I'm being responsive to these life forms, like these like animist fields of latent potential. Um, and they're so mysterious. It's like, if I try to think, if I think I know what it is, it's like I immediately overly like constrain it's like it's unfurling so then for me it's like art making has this yeah very very subtle relational quality where you know that there's something that's like calling calling forth like drawing you into its gravitational field, like calling you into its orbit. And then you just have to like, let yourself be moved by how it wants to come into being. And then also like know yourself. It's like be in your own body and be in your own discernment as well. Um, so it feels like it's like any art project is like a relationship that I'm nurturing. Um, and it's always in service to more aliveness. It's like just more aliveness. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> I realize it's not, and it's hard to express because it's, that's why I call it sometimes like ritual art. Um, Cause there is, there's materiality. It's like, it'll call together bodies in space. Like there will be artifacts that come through it. Like someone might write something or I'll paint something or yeah. Like there's like, there's so many ways in which this aliveness will take on different skins, but like none of, none of the skins are the actual work that's, mm living yeah hmm. so much there in there that i'll be digesting for a long time i feel so thank you for sharing that uh i think we'll come back to some of those themes um something i want to make sure to ask you about is um you seem to me to have a practice of uh, like starting calls with some silence and beginning connection from there. And I wanted to ask you about that practice, why you do that and what that means to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I, and I love asking, I love asking for silence. It feels like a gift when someone enters silence with me. I think there's like, um, yeah, there's a sacred presence in silence. And then phenomenologically what happens for me when I slow down, and pause and release into silence it's it's like actually it's like energetically like this like if I'm this kind of water being that's like held together its shape like I just kind of fall apart and yeah you could say almost like a, a drop of water that just drops into the ocean and then I kind of release and it's really nice it's just like it's so um I mean, there's just a pleasure in that for me um, of releasing my skin, like releasing all the plastic feathers, releasing any kind of costume that feels like 
I need to wear. Um, and then when that all releases, yeah, there's something profound about like what happens in my body. It's like I, I actually start sensing much more from, yeah, maybe like so much of sometimes social relating can be in the head. Like, how do I show up? What, what do we talk about? What's the content? But then I actually drop kind of like lower, just like into the belly, into the heart. Like I, I can feel this, um, yeah, it's almost like the, the awareness just starts to move and fan out in this way that's much more, yeah, much more around a kind of felt. <laughs> I'm smiling because like, I, it, it's been, I've been like working with the shape of it, almost like a an underwater jellyfish with tentacles. Like it feels like there's some part of my body sensing organ that's like, it just kind of reaches out and then like feels the field. And then I kind of like, sometimes we'll shyly reach out and like feel the other body or the other awareness in the field. And then there's almost like this whole, um, it's like, it's curious in its own way. Like um, that way of almost like embodied knowing of the field between us. Like, it's like, oh, what's here? Like, what's, what are these little attunements that are happening in my body? Like, why is my heart fluttering? And then I'm curious about that. Or why, why is this kind of like image or color being evoked? And then there's kind of like this tentacular feeler towards that. And often like when I kind of regather myself, it's like, there is a kind of spontaneity in whatever arises. That's just like, yeah, a kind of gestalt. Um, it's like, it's almost like it goes out and then it just comes in and it's like, of course, this is the right. This is exactly what's here. And I just, I trust that to be, yeah, like my, my compass of that truth, the truth that I seek through art. It's like, yeah, anything that is pre-prepared or like, it's, it's good to prepare a little bit. It's kind of like, you know, setting up the field, like allowing, allowing things to be ready at hand, but whatever is actually being called forth, I feel like kind of comes out from, it comes through from a very different source. Um, so silence like really just allows me, like it gives me permission to go there. Like it gives me space to go there. And then it allows me to just like really show up and be with another in a way that feels true. Like it feels true. I could imagine an alternate world where you instead had a practice of like before a, a call or a meeting or some kind of gathering or something like took time to be by yourself and be silent and still uh, it seems important to you that it's sort of social and in connection with the person that you're spending time with and I wonder what's different for you about that. Mm. It's very it is very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like even prior to this call, like I, I sat for my morning meditation and I was sensing like into being in relationship with you and kind of like wondering what posture I might enter for this call. But it's like, I just don't know. I won't know until I my body is in some kind of like spatial field or like spatial temporal field with you. So, and I don't know why, it just like, um, that just feels like very obvious to me. It's like, of course I won't know until I'm in relationship with another and then we're both attuned or like we're both just like, and I can't really speak for the other person. I think sometimes um, 
it's like every person will enter space and silence very differently. Um, but I know that for me, it's, it's just when I get to be in silence with another being like, that's, that's like the world that I enter. It's like, oh, now we are, we are cre like just our bodies and space together begins to orbit around a kind of like emerging cosmos. So then I want to feel, it's like, what is this world like? What is it? look like like often actually it'll show up imagistically to me it'll just be like for some reason I'm seeing I see landscapes like I see I see us in a whale belly I I feel us um yeah I feel us like moving or I feel us very still like there's just like a kind of something imaginally will arise um and it might have some cues around like my projections of that person but, and, but most of the time, like including that, there's also a kind of mystery to it. Like, I just really don't know what I will encounter. Um, yeah, which is why that moment of like presence with each other, like just like silent presence is, yeah, it's very intimate and It's like it's intimate and it's like the way that I would love to communicate with everyone. Like it's like that's like my favorite way to actually communicate. Hmm. How have your experiences during these moments of silence and connecting to the field shifted? your connections with people and what's happened when you've shared the images or experiences that come up for you in those moments? How do those, how does sharing what, it's like sort of a two-part question of like, how does that experience affect you and how does sharing what you experience affect your interactions with other people? Yeah, I know I noticed myself almost in the tensegrity of the dark and the light of this form of communicating, like this way of being in relationship with others. Like both experienced in myself and in kind of like feedback from others as well. I think like starting starting with like the potential that I think both myself and others are kind of alluded to in that way of being is like, there's something that's so, there's a wonder to it. It's like a kind of enchanting quality to, it's kind of co-participation with reality. It's like, we're kind of conjuring every, like every conversation, every moment of encounter is like a kind of conjuring. There is like a there is a magic to the way that we can kind of like author and co-author um, 
reality with each other. So I think there's like this kind of often like this world building sandbox quality. Like it, it calls forth like innocence, a kind of like childlike play that is both very sensual in the way that when you're young, like you're, you don't overly think about things like you just know what you love and you know what you're attracted to and you know what you want to create, you know, when you want to climb that tree, you know, that you want to like stare at this flower and you know how to like, it's just, there's like this kind of easefulness in which you play with reality. So I find that like, um, in its most, um, yeah, like liberating potential, it has that way of like bringing together that imaginal, like Robert Bay, I would kind of call it like cosmopoesis, like this ability to create worlds again. Um, the danger of it, the dark side of it is if you can't, if, and it, this is like hard to discern. It's like, I have such a rigorous practice in soul making Dharma, for example, like that's my, that's like my practice lineage. And when I say that, I mean, I hold a lot of this kind of weaving of image and story with a kind of foundation of emptiness. Like these are all like, we're kind of like costuming reality and fabricating reality all the time. So why can't, like, why are we not consciously fabricating in ways that feel more true and good and beautiful. There's like something around that form of reality. Um, creation, like, especially when, like, I, I would consider myself someone who can like conjure reality, which is like someone, someone might actually get kind of like too drawn in to your story and they might not actually be completely sovereign in their relating with that kind of enchanted reality. Um, and it might be an enchanted reality that they themselves are actually co-participating in, but I've had experiences where, um, yeah, you end up really clinging to or feeling attached to certain images that are being conjured like it's so it's so beautiful it's so alluring that yeah there's this way in which like no I want to hold on to this this is true this is what I'm going to live for now this is what I'm going to yeah this is you you end up Yeah, you you can very easily in these territories like end up almost like creating a cult out of your own visioning um, and forgetting that it's also transparent, like it's also diaphanous. Um, and like, I think that practice of like remembering to kind of release and let go, it's one thing to kind of like know it as like a move but when when there's like a particular story or image that's just it makes you feel like yeah it gives you hope for example or it gives you a sense of like security and like direction and um deep intimacy I think that's when it's yeah it just it just is dangerous it's it's a dangerous a dangerous space like this kind of enchantment of reality and especially I think when you're working with mystery like with silence with kind of like storytelling like I, I'm I feel like it's so important for me to <laughs> I think this is yeah I, I like this question a lot because I've been very much with almost like the ethics and responsibility of 
soul making and magic and reenchantment and mystical participation because I feel like like I want more and more people to like know that deep kind of divine capacity within of co-authoring and co-participating in kind of like reality creation and then there's also um yeah there's like it's kind of unleashing something that if there's like a kind of it's sparky it's fiery it can untether you often from it can untether you if you get too carried away into the clouds. That's why the frames are actually really important. Um, and the frame shifting continually is also very important. So I think basically in response to your question, I have, yeah, in for example, practices like collective presencing and imaginal participation. Um, like I hosted a project called Participação Mystique in Berlin, which was all around like collective art making, um, ritual art making. So 10 of us gathered online for six months and then met up for 10 days together in Berlin. And it was amazing. Like there was something about it that was so like the power of the power and the creativity that comes from just like sourcing new realities together and making art out of it. Um, but there was like, so, and I was noticing in myself, it's like, you kind of, you're like, well, we saw this thing together, so it must be real. Um, and there is, there's like something that, there's like something that um, can really amplify reality distortion as well. Um, so the wisdom of working with imaginal play of tuning into like these kind of like other forms of sensing of conjuring stories. Um, yeah. I think there's just like a, there's a responsibility that we hold to each other um, in the midst of it that still is in its process of like needing to be clarified um, and needing to be created really as a culture. I find myself drawn to this practice that you have and curious about it. And I can sort of reverse engineer from practicing it with you and hearing you talk about it, how I might do it myself, but I would love to hear from you uh, almost sort of instructions of <laughs> suggestions of how to go about having a practice like this, both for myself or, <clears throat> excuse me, for others who might be interested as well. Mm. what's I'm curious like what's your story of what this practice is if you were to reverse engineer mm. 
Well, hmm. there's a lot I could say, but um, seems like taking time to be silent with someone else or a group before connecting opens up space to let in wisdom on multiple dimensions that might otherwise be crowded out by conceptual thinking or words or speaking and that when you have that space, um, it seems like for you, you're connecting to a kind of field or shared reality that um, almost like if you're this octopus, uh, there might, the other person may or may not be an octopus and they may or may not be feeling or consciously aware of what you're sensing. And yet it's there all the same. And that when you make space to connect there, it's possible to sort of um, almost do the like soul equivalent of like contact improv where you're like hey you're yes. here and I'm here <laughs> what what are we feeling here and uh uh I imagine you could make sense of that field or heart space in multiple ways but um it's powerful and intimate and meaningful and um What I can feel more I want to say about this. Um, mm. Yeah, I think I'm learning how to dance there with people. And I think sometimes I have a sense of conversations or friendships or relationships as like, for example, this being not just Tashin and Cheryl, two people talking, but oh, Tashin and Cheryl is speaking right now that there's this... Um, dyad that we are our third being that's um mm. made up of us almost as like organs of a larger thing and that it seems like mm, yeah when i can when i can connect to that reality and someone is willing to meet me there it's more enlivening for me and more meaningful and more fulfilling and kind of better than seeing myself as this separate person that's like talking to another separate person and they're just happening to overlap um, and that's fine to be there if need be but it's much more fulfilling to be in this kind of a space. And um, it seems like this practice of connecting to silence and uh, sort of like a shared field or reality, imaginally or other, in another way, um, helps to deepen into that kind of a connection where it's less about separate individuals sort of passing in the night and more of uh, an interwoven shared reality. Mm. Yeah, that's a beautiful description. I really, I've, in the way that you described it, it feels very much like rocked in your being, which is really cool. Yeah, and it, basically, everything that you're sharing feels like kind of in that direction of. I do. Yeah. It's like, I, I have, um, a strong sense and even like it, it moves more towards like conviction that depending on where we locate our awareness, um, we can really speak from different postures that are both like within like what we consider interior and then like outside. So you can like distributed consciousness is something that you can really attune to or play with and it's like very exciting to do so with another person or with a group of people and in collective presencing which is the practice that I started doing about four years ago like the simplest way of just like uh directing or 
gesturing your awareness to something that isn't just in you is like towards the middle. So we always say when you're collective presence saying there's a group of us sitting in circles together and what we're attuning to here is speaking to and from the middle. And the way that one speaks to and from the middle is not, it's like for me, it was very much like almost like dropping into a completely different awareness state where I don't really, like I can't know in advance what the middle wants to speak through me or what I want to speak to um, the middle. It's much more like I start to track and follow and trust a completely different set of biomarkers. Like um, for some reason, this kind of like buildup of intensity or like this quality of, mm -hmm. oh, something here like wants to come through and I don't know what it is. And I, I have this impulse to just like pick up the piece, like pick up the talking piece in the midst of this silence so that I can just allow this flow to move through me. And it's, it's close to actually um, Quaker meetings where you speak when spirit wants to speak through you. And yeah, I find practices like this just allow us to play in that membrane between like self, other, and world and really like extend or kind of push up against the edges of what we bound in the arena of self. And it is like, it's it's an uncanny space to, to enter because boundaries are not like walls um, that split you and separate you. But like for me, it's actually closer to like a membrane of many different layers. Like it's just like membranes with pores that can open and close, like more like, I don't know, sand dunes or like layers of shimmering curtains that kind of like shift and fold. And then it's it's just like a very different form of navigation. It's like, how do you find, like, how do you find each other and meet each other? Um, And then what happens like, and the thing that's like so amazing for me in these, in the invitation to encounter like self, other and world through this kind of folding, undulating field, the social field is there's like moments where you actually do find each other and you find, you find that center. And it's just like the immediate, like the feeling of it is so electrifying. It's like when someone speaks to the middle and everyone knows like, yes, that is true. We all know that's in the middle. It's like, it's, it's like feeling like you've been alone. And then suddenly you realize I've always been held in community and we're, we're actually, we're not separate. We're, we're seeing and feeling and knowing this, like knowing something together. And that, yeah, that kind of, that kind of knowing, like the kind of knowing that like makes your heart kind of leap out and makes you just like cry because there's like a profound kind of loneliness that's suddenly like dissipating, like you're just meeting in that way. Like I can imagine why it feels like, like a God, like, encounter it's like you're just like encountering a quality of relational intimacy that like besides kind of religious um cultures or yeah i think it's it's very how do you how do we how do we actually afford that kind of deep intimate encounter with reality and a reality that's kind of that's like relational in that way it's just like it's so relational and it's like a dance and you can't go you can't just go straight there like it's like 
you're moving and you're kind of dancing. And then at some point it just comes so close and you meet and then you kind of come apart again. Like I, yeah, I find myself just so drawn to almost like a lifelong study of that, like in, in my desire to afford more spaces where that can happen. Um, because like that kind of contact just completely transforms you every time. It's just like, it's like this form of ingression. Like you're letting, you're letting yourself, you're allowing yourself to be like changed in this way. And it's not private. It's not like I'm just sitting here on a meditation cushion and like trying to get to insight. It like really humbles you in the relational encounter with another, where you know that that kind of knowing, like that kind of contact can't actually be. Yeah. It's like it, it, it like requires you to be in relationship with another, like that kind of risk, that kind of, um, like, I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, so, and then I, and then I do, and in my hypothesis in the space is that's where, that's where like creativity really can like rupture through. It's like in, in my research, like I, I consider it like transversal. It's just these these like lines of flight from the known or two, like, it's like two knowns that are in paradoxical or contradictory relationship with one another kind of like generate so much friction in the kind of tension held to the point where you can feel actually the rapture of something like latent that actually is like coming through. Like that's like, that's the future that we can't imagine actually coming through, but our, even though we can't imagine it, our bodies know how to recognize it. Like our bodies know through like orbital attraction, just through like, I don't know why, but something's like calling me close. And then when I drop all the stories away about why, like, yeah, when I drop all the stories away and it's just like deep attunement to animal body sensing, to energy body sensing, to just like a kind of clarifying and trusting of that yeah of that attraction it's like oh it's it's going to it's going to just like disclose itself at it's just going to disclose itself <laughs> you just keep trusting that even and you won't know when and you won't know what it is but then when it happens it's just pure illumination and it's, yeah, it's, it's so hard to describe other than like, even as I describe it, it's so annoying to me because it's like, then I feel like I'm kind of describing something that people are like, oh, that's what it's like. I'm going to do it that way. And it's like, it's not that either. Um, hmm. It's yeah. I think that's why the playfulness is so important. There's like no getting it right. Um Yeah. And talking about it makes me shy, actually, because mm. um, it's it's like personally so. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's so meaningful. It's so it matters so much. And it matters like oh, I feel so good when I feel it, feel that happening in the field. Um, but it's almost like the moment I talk about it, like something, I don't know. I get, I get scared that I'm like not getting, yeah. it's almost like this, like the mark on the page has consequences and I, I don't know how I've shifted things by uttering something that's pretty ineffable basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I also truly have no idea what I just said. So <laughs> you 
you said many beautiful and wise things that will be of benefit to myself and to many people in an act of Greek compassion. That's how I see it. Okay. <laughs> I trust you on that. <laughs> it's like ameliorating some of the like, oh my gosh, what did what just <laughs> Yeah. I appreciate. Thank you for um Yeah, it's like, thank you for like letting me talk about my love of God. That's okay. kind of like, that's what I wanted to say. But like, almost like bracket that as um, like not in any kind of denominational, like theological sense, but just like this, like radical experience of Yeah, like the kind of like, yeah, that kind of, it's so, it's so hard to describe, but it's so intimate. And it's like the most precious, sacred kind of experience. And, and we all have that. It's like, we all have that. It's like right there, always, right here, always. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to keep remembering that. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, we have about 10 minutes and I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to say more about or talk about together. I leave the space to you. What's your relationship with God, Tashin? Mm -hmm. mm, I feel... recently connected to God. I've believed in God for, I don't know, more than a decade at this point, after an intense atheist period in my teenage years. Uh, but my relationship with God has become more intimate in the last few months even. And um, I was thinking about A, yeah, this conversation reminds me of a question that's on my heart about God, about one of the ways that I'm most connected to God right now is um, almost like a serendipity in my life where almost the metaphor that comes to mind is like being on God's rhythm or being on God's calendar almost because I, you know, like calendar, use my calendar all the time. And it's like, I'm in, there's a feeling sometimes of being in the right place at the right time. And having the conversation that needs to happen or doing the thing that needs to happen or something beautiful and magical happening. That's not something I could have predicted or planned and subjectively internally, I'm going in or out of being on God's time. It feels like sometimes I'm on rhythm and sometimes I'm off rhythm. And I'm sure from a larger perspective, zooming out, um, I'm actually always on God's rhythm, always in time, part of some larger, but, but subjectively it's like, oh, I'm either in or I'm out and we're in right now. <laughs> we're in right now. And I have this question actively about, uh, what is it to be on God's rhythm or not? And how am I getting in or out? What am I doing to get in or out? What am I holding on to that's preventing me from being in God's rhythm? What am I letting go of? to stay in God's rhythm or return to God's rhythm and how do I be there more often and Peace Pilgrim had a very similar question that 
I imagine was also different. Like the subjective phenomenological experience that she was having was actually probably pretty different from the way she describes it. But the shape of the question is similar where it's like she was, there was this experience that she'd had. Yeah. Of being connected to God actually. But I, you know, I'm, I just imagine her experience is different than mine, but um, she was like, why am I not there all the time? How do I, how do I get there all the time? And she was asking this question for like 15 years. And then one time, one morning she woke up and she was like, oh, I'm never getting off rhythm again. Got it. Um, I'm, I'm never, that wasn't how she described it, but she's like, I'm, I'm not leaving. And um, hmm. anyway, I, as I say, it feels more like the shape of the question is similar, even though I suspect our subjective experiences were different, but um, yeah, I think that's one of the ways that I most acutely relate to God is, is almost being in an ocean, like a, swimming in a sea of um, yeah, like perfection, where we're I'm in the right place at the right time, talking to the right people, doing going through exactly what I need to go through and um, mm. something that's larger than me that I'm held by and carried forward by. Um, I, another metaphor that comes to mind is like, I love the film Donnie Darko. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah. I, you know, there's this like the, the, yeah, with the... the chess, <laughs> yeah. This like tunnel coming out of people. And it really feels like that sometimes where um, it's just like, oh, I'm I'm being carried forward into this experience that needs to happen. And um, it gets kind of weird in so far as like, questions of like fate or free will mm. come up and um yeah a, a metaphor that occurred to me recently with that is almost like there's a gravity or uh, a weight to the universe where certain things feel like they're like stacked or weighted to happen for me in my life where like for example like 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 that I'm going to spread love with my life like that looking back on things that happen to me I'm like that's just that's just what I will be doing and other things feel less determined and like I have more agency or say over and that that's okay uh, within the larger plan for me to be like oh I'd like to do this or do that and some things are like this is just going to happen this is um or like very highly likely to happen like high probability or something and mm. anyway um mm. something larger than myself that I am connected to that's holding the universe and time and meaning and almost the plot almost the plot of the universe <laughs> mm. yeah yeah that's that's my experience of god at this time mm, i love that it's bringing it's bringing in another dimensionality like around um because you were you were just describing it but i it's like what does it feel like when you're on god god's time like how do you know how do you know it's rightness like what are like bonnie roy would i let love her term like biomarkers like for me it always comes back to like why do i know when i'm in integrity and aligned to something a kind of like right harmony um and the harmony isn't always like, it's like the harmony can be expressed in hardship and suffering as well, but there's like a rightness to it. Yeah. And I, I wonder about how, yeah, it's like, what does it mean to mutually relationally support each other um, to find that kind of alignment that kind of yeah like a kind of like a a god's rhythm that like a yeah divine rhythm a cosmic rhythm that just like brings back like brings us back into It's so inutterable, but for now, I'm just going to say it just brings us back into rightness, like just brings us back into rightness. Uh, 
And I'm just remembering um, It's like my heart is so open when I experience that rightness. It's like it's so open that <laughs> I just want to laugh and cry at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's just like it's so <sighs> Yeah, it's one of I I'm just actually remembering when we spent time together at Steph Susliff's house and I can't remember the exact contents of the conversation, but there was this like sense of, oh, like what it means to kind of expand one's heart to just like be more intimate with reality, like that kind of, <sighs> yeah, just like this um, holding, holding more of the world and your heart. Um, yeah, and I think I, I've just like let, I, when I was younger, I just like pushed really hard to feel more. And now there's actually much more of this, like, as I'm, even as I'm saying, I'm relaxing. It was just like, you're, no one, like, it's like, no one's like, more people need to hold it together. That's actually the way. Like we need a bigger heart. We just need more hearts um, to hold more reality together. And there's almost like this, um, I've been like really present with, yeah, almost like a form of spiritual activism towards more equitable distribution of that kind of compassion and sensitivity and like a kind of, it is, it should not be incumbent upon like a special feel, few to like feel the pain and reality and also the joy and like aliveness of the world. It's, it's actually, it's, it's such a, it's, it demands kind of, it just demands collect collectivity, communal um, holding. And maybe that's probably, that's like why I find myself so drawn to spaces of collective divining. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today and sharing such a space together. It's uh, been beautiful to hear from you and to witness your heart. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tashin. Thank you for, I really admire. Yeah, I, I admire your being. I really admire your being and I'm grateful that you are alive. <laughs> Feelings very mutual friend. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>